Akatsuki Lemon here is a friend of mine for the past few years and a doll photographer. You still have to deal with people outside, right? The public who may come and observe what you do. So, how do you deal with this? Hello everyone and welcome back to x Kurogani Studio. Though I'm at home though, not in studio. So today it is my first episode of podcast with Akatsuki Lemon over here. Each episode is about an hour in length or so. And there are at least four or five episodes at the bare minimum being planned for the future. And at a, at a frequency of once a month. So that's the plan for now. Akatsuki Lemon here is a friend of mine for the past few years and a doll photographer. So today we will be talking about doll photography in general. So I'm putting up his links over here for his Instagram and Twitter. Please do check it out and subscribe to his photography works, to his channel. He does great photography. So yeah, Lemon, please introduce yourself to everyone else. Hi everyone, my name is Lemon, as we just said, under the Instagram handle and Twitter handle Arkatsuki underscore Lemon, which you have just seen on the screen. I have been, well, I used to do Nandroid and some scale figures until I moved over to Dolls, I think a little bit less than three years ago. And I also am currently now stationed around Sydney, go around a lot for Dolls outdoors mainly, I don't really do indoor stuff. And... Although I'd like to go back to Nandroid sometime soon, it is kind of hard with all my, well, not all, I'd say maybe like 80% of my stuff being back in Hong Kong. As you know, coming to Australia and being stuck here for three years is not really that great. As Kay just said, check my stuff uh, in the links, you know, give it a like, give it a subscribe, you know, and all that. Okay, so uh, you have switched to doll photography about three years ago. What made you switch to dolls in the first place? So the, the main problem with Nendroids, at, at least at the time, around maybe, say, mid to late 2019, was that I was already coming to Australia, I mean, Sydney to be exact, for studying. And well, as you can see, I cannot bring like tens of hundreds of fucking Nendroids over here, right? No, 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 that's not going to happen. And the main problem with not just Nendroids is that you can't just have one Android like that. You gotta have face plates, you gotta have password, and the most important thing is you gotta have like a DRAM for the entire yeah, that thing. Yeah. And that then that is the biggest problem. Not not the pants. The pants is fine. You can you shove in, in like a box, shove in a suitcase and voila, done. But with the dioramas, I uh, actually tried approaching like different stores here and hey, uh, do you guys have you know, construction pass with dioramas for they scale models and all that and Yes, that does exist, and good lord, let me tell you, they overcharge compared to like okay. Chinese stores and tablets like four or five times. Holy shit! Anyway, so around mid twenty nineteen, and I thought to myself, is there anything else that helps me utilize what I have right now? Helps me utilize the scenery I get because I was thinking that maybe then it was too small. At that time, I also branched over to like the one twelve scale Asia and stuff that was like yeah. this big. Yeah. Too small. No, or way too small. Same problem. You need dioramas, you need props, which is even harder. And I thought to myself, well, everyone says like the ultimate thing for like figure stuff is technically speaking dolls. And I went like, maybe I should try it out. So I kind of tried and switch over earlier days before actually 2019. That did not work with Azon stuff being not that great. Azon is not a brand of dolls. I don't currently touch Azon anymore. No, thank you. We can go over that sometime soon. But Around 2019, mid to late 2019, I started contacting some friends and contacts I had and started building the first and my second doll at the time. And they got finished around December, I think the last few days of like December 2019. Yeah. I like your logic here where you say Nandroids are difficult to transport over despite their small size, but you have no issues carrying big ass dolls over to Australia. Well, no, 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 no. So, the, 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 okay, I get what you mean. I get what you mean. No, no, shout, shout, shout. No. So the problem with with dolls is that they might seem a lot more to bring. And yes, that is true. That is yeah. true. They are a lot more to bring because you've got the doll itself, which is like this 
like this big. I can't, I can't even fit 50, on a screen on my camera. 50 Dr. centimeters, Dr. right? No, no, no. Mine's 42. Thank God. Okay. Thank God mine's 42 because <laughs> I usually touch with the many size ones. Okay. The bigger ones, which you see, are, are the adult looking ones are like 55 to 60. That's Dolphy territory, even right? 50 to 60. Yep, that's Dolphy territory. Mine's okay. mini Dolphy. Oh, it's okay. not that bad. And those are way heavier. And my back is going to break. No, thank you. Anyway, what was the question again? Uh, oh, yeah. So the main problem is that dolls are actually less fragile in a way compared to D-Ramas. Ah, yeah, that's You true. cannot transport <clears throat> D-Ramas. That, that is just... That that's is it. True. That's that end of question. You cannot cut her back. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So <laughs> the problem here is actually the props, the diorama, right? Yeah, pretty much. And the biggest, other biggest problem with Nandro is that you only can have a lot of parts, and those parts just keep going, going, and going. I remember my previous Nandro account. I think in around 2019, because I haven't been on in three years, was around 220, and I sold quite a few. Mm -hmm. So it should be. It should realistically more be around 180 at that point, but imagine this. Every Nandroid has at least two faceplates. Yep. And let's say half of those, right? No, well, not half. Half of the 180 have yeah. one faceplate that you want to bring. Mm -hmm. That's not including the character ones. That's only including like the special Nandroid faceplates you see, like the ones you kind of want in, in a set or you want in like a photo. You got to bring that. Yeah. That amounts to, you know, at um, least 90 faceplates. It's I'm optional, more concerned, by the way. I'm more concerned about the small parts, you know, like arms and legs, you know, because oh, God. personally, I am very bad at keeping small parts. I will lose them. No, that's actually not the biggest <laughs> problem. The biggest problem as well is how many they are and how many Nendroids themselves in the break. Back at home, I basically binned, I think, 70% of the boxes and I don't really keep the boxes anymore because realistically there's no way you're gonna fit one uh, maybe 200 no 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 I'm you know Vince I uh, think yes. you know Vince yes yeah yeah he has like a room for that I don't I don't a I can't keep that room but for anyway. Nandroid parts alone no 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 just like boxes boxes wow it's okay. like a wall it's like a wall that guy's insane yeah, yeah. anyway I can't do that no way I'm doing that so I basically check all the boxes and even back home, I'm digging through like three or four boxes of like, where is that specific Nendro's faceplate part? Like, digging through hundreds of them just to find one thing. <laughs> and just to bring that box itself is already a big nightmare. I'm not bringing more of that. Mm -hmm. And it's actually less of the transport issue, more of the, the fact that you need a lot of things to do Nendro's compared with dolls. I know you also do need a lot of things, but if you have a good, say, scene outdoors, if you have a good, it's not diorama because, of course, of course, but if you have a good place to go to, it basically leaves a lot of things. It's a shame that, like, you know, dolls kind of is a substitute for one-to-one -one human sized things, but of course it's not. It never will be unless, you know, you know some people can make them life-size in photos and edit that way. Yeah. Try and do that. It's really hard. I haven't even like done the prototype yet, so okay. that in itself is a problem. Not really a transport. So actually, uh, the part where you moved from Hong Kong to Australia to further your studies, that will be a topic for another day because the amount mm -hmm. of challenges associated with moving all these things, yeah, that is a huge topic altogether. So today, we shall focus on the doll photography part. And yeah, regarding the dolls just now, you said yours are about over 40 centimeters in size, not the 50 or 60 ones. So I have always wondered, since I'm not so familiar with dolls, uh, Dolphy Dreams and, you know, BJDs, they are quite different, right, from what I know, but I'm mm -hmm. not exactly mm -hmm. sure what are their differences. Okay, so a very important thing to consider is that ball joint dolls have been a thing since, I don't know, maybe like even like the 50s, or even made longer than that. But okay, the important thing is to know that ball joint dolls existed way before Dolphy was a thing. Mm -hmm. And some ball joint doll collectors don't consider Dolphys, at least A Zone and Dolphy and no, Volks 
and also smart doll, technically ball joint dolls, because of a specific thing. Let me explain. For ball joint dolls, they don't really technically have quote unquote joints. They're tightened by a string of some sort inside the body oh. and pulled tight on the neck. So, so it is a bit you're like basically a puppet. Pulling... It's a bit yes, like Yes, it's basically yeah. a puppet. It's a string <laughs> puppet of some kind, now I understand. So those yep. are BJDs. So, like, yep, so the hands, uh. if you move them like this or like that, it's pulled by a, an elastic string of some sort, mm -hmm. which to be honest, I'm not really that familiar with. I never touch those because those are actually way more fragile and way heavier than what they should be. Of course, that comes into us value as well. And I know a lot of people who do dolphies also do ball joint dolls, but you know, not my thing because usually ball joint dolls are like the semi-realistic ones and uh, some people do consider that really uncanny, mm -hmm. including me. I mean, some people do consider like even anime kind of looking ones uncanny, not yeah. to imagine those ones, you know? But okay, with dolphies, imagine, okay, it's a really bad way to put it, but it's a really easy way to do it. Imagine a Figma, right? Okay. Imagine, you know the base body Figmas, right? The, the yep. base flesh type, white type bodies? Yep, yep. Imagine that and enlarging from one twelfth scale to one third scale. That's actually kind of like Dolphy or, or like Azon Dolls or a Smart Doll. Ah, so That's it is kind more, of like, it is. more like a classic or, yeah, a typical classic action figure, but way larger. Yes, uh, you could say it's like a massive passion figure. Mm -hmm. That's also why like, the ball joint doll people really hate it. That's why the people who don't have experience with ball joint dolls actually love it, because it's way easier to maintain. Well, comparatively speaking, of course, it's way easier to maintain, way easier to pose, and less tedious to carry. I see. So That's mainly the difference. All right. So what are the weight differences anyway? Average. So what I... Okay, what I carry, an uh, MDD, mm -hmm. Mini Dolphy Dream, like that thing, let's say a usual outfit that I put on with the head, one of these is around, say, maybe 800 to one, uh, 800 grams to one kilo, around that. One kilo? That's it's a actually lot lighter a bit than heavy. Oh, because there are many. Okay. That's the mini ones. Okay. The normal ones go up to 1.5 ish, and that's talking if you're using like a unmodified body like straight out from the factory mm -hmm. some people do 3d manufacture like different parts different joints and i know some people like a massive community over in taiwan they make metal bones literally metal build like quite uh -huh. literally metal build yes and that bumps the weight up to like three kilos okay and here's the funny part that's with the modified ones Okay. A BJD, yeah. A BJD is three kilos. Three it's kilos. It's pretty much double the. It's pretty much double the weight, which also means posing the doll itself is a lot harder because the le imagine a loose joint on like a figure. Yeah. That's pretty much ball joint doll because the hand itself is a lot heavier and you have to support a lot more weight. That means mm -hmm. posing is harder. That means transporting a thing is harder. That means even getting the thing to stand up on its own is already a goddamn nightmare. Yeah, yeah. Main difference, okay. pretty much weight double. Okay, so you bring two dolls, at, uh, usually one or two dolls out for photography. That is like three kilos for the dolls alone, and then there's camera gear, lenses, and so on. Yep. And the supports that yep. would be at least ten kilos in the back. Pretty much, pretty much. So the thing yeah. is, I used to, all the way back in 2020 when I first started doing all this, I used to kind of bring out two dolls. But eventually, like not eventually, kind of recently, starting in mid twenty twenty one, I gave up that because I wanted to focus on one doll. I wanted to focus on one shot. I want to do one thing. Yeah. This is gonna be a thing we talk about later today. But mm -hmm. if I, it, essentially, what I bring out is only one doll and camera gear and all the supports. And oh boy, let me assure you, all the supports, all the camera gear itself, kind of evens out with a second doll. Okay. Doesn't really make a difference. It's still very heavy. Yeah, and yeah. It kind of hurts my back. Pretty much similar hey, to boys, what don't do, do. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah, similar to what I actually do with my figure photography. I mean, I carry one single skill figure usually when I 
If I do go out, right, I usually do my work indoors as a diorama in studio, but if I do go out, I usually concentrate on one single figure at a time. Most of the time, we think that we can bring more out so that, you know, our content creation is more efficient, where in one single photo session, you can make several photos, several different figures or dolls, but actually that might backfire because you can't concentrate on one single project. Yeah, and then there is this problem where you get distracted. You still have to deal with people outside, right? The public who may come and observe what you do. So how do you deal with this? Okay, this is a really interesting one because how should I say this? In a way, it's interesting when you compare people in Hong Kong and people in Sydney or Australia in general. Maybe Sydney is different. Because I know cities were different from a lot of different cities in Australia, but let's not go into that. So in Japan, let, let's take an example. In Japan, it's actually really common because lots of different people, a lot of different interests. Yep. In Japan, people really don't care. It's also related to like how the society works, how the culture works, but I'm not mm. predicting that. In Hong Kong, people mostly observe, look at you, and they might take a photo and take a photo of you, take a video of you, and they probably won't post that. They actually probably won't post that unless you're doing something outrageous. You know, mm -hmm. imagine doing a bunny suit, like a doll in a bunny suit, and shooting in like out oh, of the, the central of the goddamn city. Mm -hmm. People, of course, are gonna upload a photo of you. Like that's actually being a bit of a, you know a creep. That kind of gets over that part. But okay, and yeah, but in Hong Kong, people just don't really care about you. They look at you with weird, like look at you weird. Yeah, but that's pretty much the extent of it. But I, as I don't really have that much experience shooting in Hong Kong, like, at least for now, I'll talk about the experience I had shooting in Sydney mm -hmm. and the difference between what you're using, how you're putting it, and what your reaction is going to be. Mm -hmm. Let's take three different times examples. Let's take a 2020, 2021, and recently. So 2020, I was shooting without a tripod, one camera, one flash, one lens, and had a doll at the place. Minimal lighting because I was having like the least amount of gear, I didn't want to bear myself out. And the reactions I usually get are actually kind of nice mm -hmm. in a way. Like, that, that's funny, I know, but they don't really judge you for that. They don't really care. They just come and say, like, oh, that's interesting. That's pretty cool. Can I take a photo of it? I'm like, sure, I don't care. Mm -hmm. That's really nice. And it's a good thing if you're having minimal gear because the security looks at you and goes, ha ha. Uh, dumb Asian looking doll, uh, don't <laughs> care. Even, with the, but here's the thing, even with like minimal amount of gear, I still got stopped quite a few times back in 2020, but mostly still fine. I see. Fast forward. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm a bit <laughs> sick, man. Guys, I'm a bit sick. Shut up. I don't sound like this. Shut up, shut up, shut up. So in 2021, I started using a tripod more and my setup usually consists of tripod, camera, one flash on the top, maybe two lights, the doll, and maybe two stands because I wanted to more have stabi a more stability because mm. I kind of dropped my doll at the end of 2020. Kay kind of laughed at me for that for quite a while. I still hate you for that, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but anyway, so this gets you way more attention because you look a lot more professional with a tripod. Yep. No matter how, well, unless you're using a point and shoot, like a literal really small one, mm. any entry level DSLR, as long as you're with a tripod and with like a flash, it is going to get you attention. That's pretty, ch pretty much how it works. And during the time when I use a tripod, I kind of got stopped a little bit more because they say, oh, you're not allowed to shoot here with a tripod. And yeah. they and I ask them, hey, but I'm allowed to shoot here, right? And they say, no, 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 you're allowed to shoot here. It's just that we don't, we, we can't allow you to use a tripod and that's pretty much the end of it. You can shoot, we don't really care. Mm -hmm. but just don't use a tripod, you know? And with a tripod, people start to look at you quite a bit more. And when I started using more stuff for shooting, I've gotten more questions, such as people coming in, oh, is this like a professional thing? Or, oh, is this like you're shooting for a magazine or for a company or something like that? People uh, automatically assume like you're more professional. Yeah, people but, judge you by your gear, right? By the equipment you bring. With very. You. Yeah. Oh boy, they, they very much do. It's, I think it's the same with pretty much everyone. Like I do, I just people for the gear. Everyone does it. Mm. Let's be honest. I but think over here, forward. yeah, over here, I think 
people judge you just like based on the type of camera you use, not necessarily just a tripod, you know. For example, over here, if we come to anime events, conventions, and so on, yeah, as long you have a big ass camera and then with a huge lens in front, sometimes you get a free trip all the way to the front row at a concert. The type where you are allowed to photograph, of course. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Pretty mm. much. But here's the thing. So, starting with like a few months ago, I started shooting with way more gear than I shoot. Mm. I know that's kind of, I know that sounds stupid, but of course, image quality, blah, blah, all that. I'm kind of anal about it. And currently speaking, I shoot with this is what I usually use right now. I use one body, that's the R5, with like, oh, this is not supposed to go public yet. I haven't written that stuff yet, but whatever. <laughs> so, I use an R5, two yeah. flashes, mm -hmm. one lens, and if the situation is a bit darker, I'll have two panel lights and one tube light. That's what I use right here. I'm mm -hmm. using for lighting, so you know. That's what I usually shoot with. And nowadays, I sometimes shoot with a reflector or that doubles as a diffuser if I ever need it to be under sunlight. And um, I will just say that gets you, uh, and also a tripod. Mm. And uh, <laughs> that has gotten me way more attention than I should. Yeah. Not saying that's a bad thing, but not exactly a good thing either. Because, oh boy, if you're not used to like people looking at you weird or even just looking at you, mm -hmm. oh, you're going to hate it. Yeah, like, this yeah. is a, a general a, a general tip for anyone doing like figure photography doll or anything in that like matter if you're doing anything like unless it's a proper normal human subject in like normal society cultural concerns you're gonna get attention yeah you are going to get attention you are going to get looked at and there is no second way around it the only thing that i recommend you can do like when you're starting out put in headphones yeah. and don't care about anyone else that's yes. a really way to go through it and you just have to face it Yep. When you get used to it, you, you can, you know what, what term my friends use to describe me when I'm out doing doll photos? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like I'm doing a ritual. Like I have like, everything around, like making a circle of some sort, like a, sat <laughs> a satanic demon circle. I'm like, fuck you. <laughs> but no, no, he, he's kind of right. He's kind of right. Like imagine someone doing as much gear as that and not giving like a single damn about anyone. That's how you get a good photo. And yep that's how you do it yes. and that's pretty much how i deal with it like yes. i, I kind of uh, didn't answer the question but yeah no you have you have to just tank it you have to just face it i know going out with like a second person helps a lot yeah doesn't Actually, matter if this is person, what i've been like, calling the art of giving zero fucks right out of giving zero fucks, pretty yes, much. Yes, yes. Because this is something you really need to master. Uh, the first time you go out and photograph some toy on the ground, some figurine on the ground, and then people start judging you. Is that a really childish hobby or some kind? But do you know what? The, uh, the experience I got, right, from my early years photographing figures, and then all the way to my, to my work, working adult years, you can see people's, how do you put it, their perspective change. Back in college, well, I had roommates, well, not exactly my roommates, but rather my batch mates or my college mates. They kind of look at you weird. Why do you have such a weird hobby? And then when you come out into the working society as a working adult, you'll be surprised that different people, they will view, they will look at your hobbies very differently. They are actually envious that you actually have a passion you can pursue. Yeah, they said, because working adults, they have all kinds of commitments, family as well, marriage, even having children and so on. And you are not burdened by all these things. You can pursue your own passion and people actually envy you for having such a hobby and being able to dedicate your time for it. That's my ex Yeah, that's my experience so far. So my experience with dealing with this hobby is that it is very different, your college years and your working adult years. People look at you very differently. I don't really have that experience yet because you know, mm. you're 10 years older than me. Mm -hmm. But at least for me, it's it's in a sense a, a bit more immediate because how I deal with it is uh, 
you may call me a scumbag, some might call me show off, and I will absolutely admit it. <laughs> How should I describe it in like a nicer way? When I go out for photos, and this is a stupid thing to do, it has always been a stupid thing to do. If it's expensive looking, if you have a lot of things on the ground, if you have, if you know, if you look like you know what you're doing, and if you don't give a fuck, people just assume you're kind of like, oh, he's maybe shooting for a magazine, no, oh, he yes. might be shooting for like a job That's or something. Right. Yep. You might think that might be a bad thing. No, no, no. That's a good thing because they don't want to mess with you. They don't want to give you trouble and they just let you do whatever the hell you want. Of course, there's also the side effect of you attracting sick, like more attention from the security because you look like you're a pro, but I'd rather take security and explain, no, 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 no. That's just like a hobby I do. It's not even commercial. I wish I was commercial than mm -hmm. to having to deal with like, I don't know, kids, yeah? Yep. Or parents or anyone else for that matter. But if you're talking about, say, less immediate things, say maybe how your friends or maybe how other people view you, um, I will just say I really don't have a good experience with that yet mm. because um, it's kind of related to Australia's culture and like college culture in itself because, you know, everyone likes drinking, everyone likes doing the normal stuff and whatever you're doing is not. Yep. And that kind of... No, that kind of bridges over to how professional or how much, like how much you know what you're doing, because when you're talking to them, when you're at, when they're, they're asking you things, when you show them your gear, when you t like you make it sound like you know what you're doing, mm -hmm. it, it kind of gets better, but it's also not that great either, because you know maybe young people maybe like they don't like. Other different things. Oh, in college, I have <laughs> sex. Mm, I drink. I don't do that. No, I don't do that. No, no. <laughs> I like cameras. I like shooting what I want. End of story. Pretty much that. That's yep. all I would say to other people. Yep, that is what you call a hobby and a passion. So yeah, <laughs> regarding regarding your dolls as well, you said that you needed to support them because these dolls they don't really stand on their own. Right, so you need multiple yep. supports and stands to keep them stand standing, and then mm -hmm. from what I understand, there is a lot of editing work to follow later on. Right, I mean, well, I don't get me started on that, Jesus. Yeah, I mean, I've seen I've seen your your works where you showed me the ones before and after editing, and you are like some kind of cloning master. <laughs> yeah, you you find ways to remove all these stands by cloning your images. I've been doing photography for nine years plus by now, but cloning isn't really my strongest <laughs> abilities out there. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. I guess I'll just go over how I edit a damn photo, or mm -hmm. in in that matter, how I actually do the entire process, right? Mm -hmm. So let's go over like from the very beginning, not even starting with like putting the camera down. No, 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 no. We're going way further than that. So what I usually do with a photo is that. I look on Instagram and I go like, mm, let's say it's autumn now, right? Mm -hmm. In Sydney, it's autumn and I go like, oh, what's a good spot? Wait, can I get like red leaves? Can I get like pretty flower and something like that? Look on Instagram, look for keywords and let's say, oh, that spot looks really nice. I'm, I'm going to go there. Ah, but looking for geotech images, right? To identify location. Yeah. Pretty much, just look at like geotags, look at like mm. Instagram, like influencers, like, oh, look at like all those photos. But what's important is the location. But here's the difference between, let's say, someone who doesn't really know what they're doing and what I would be doing. Not saying I do, mm -hmm. sometimes I don't really know what I'm doing, but here's what I do I look at a place and I think to myself, okay, there's a 50% chance this is all fake. Yeah, yeah. Instagram people. So what I usually do is that I look at a geotag and if it's lucky enough, I can find, say, a Google map image of it. I take a look at it and I, it's even, most of the time Google images might not even be in the same season, but I can judge how much of the angle they manipulated. Because what they do a lot is manipulating the angle. And yep. that's also a thing I do a lot. And I have to judge whether a doll can like take that angle as well. 
because with a doll compared to a human, we're going way lower. My camera is literally at ground level. Yeah. Pretty much ground level every single time. In fact, I don't think I've even gotten further up than like 50 centimeters in like a year. <laughs> That's pretty much how low you need to go with dolls if you want to make a good angle work. And I just look at how that works. Does it work? Will it work in a way? And let's say, okay, kind of does. What's the next step for me? I figure out what pose I want. So I look at different Instagrammers looking at that pose. Okay, that pose might work, that pose might not work. I have to figure that out sooner or later. Second thing, figure out what type of colors, what type of clothes I want for a doll. And I look at the theme itself. Let's say if it's a flower bed, it's a flower scene, it's a garden. I got to put out like a dress, uh, what do you call it? Like the oldest style kind of dress, like classic dresses. But if it's say like a cooler scene, I'll have like modernistic clothing, maybe like a polo jacket or something. Maybe that will work better. <laughs> mm -hmm. After I figure all those out, well, you know, pack up, get to the spot, next available time I have. I get to the spot, and then, pretty much half of the time, it doesn't really work the way you really expected it. No, no, no. <laughs> I wish it did work every single time. No, it doesn't work that way. So, let's start with the situation that it does work, okay? Make it easier. Let's say if it's like 90% as what I planned, I set up all my things, and I start figuring out the lighting first. Is the lighting hitting the doll directly? Is the lighting not hitting the doll directly? Is there sun at the scene? Can I utilize the sun in a better way? If the doll is getting blocked by sun, you know, diffuse the time. Tune up the flashes, put up more power on the flash, put up more like reflectors. If it's not getting hit by sun, you know, balance out the lighting. Figure out the lighting part first. Second thing I do, like the doll's just standing there on a stand, like, you know, one of these things. Yep. Just standing there, I'm just figuring out lighting. I'm not even putting on pose. And here's the thing. I already have the pose figured out at home. And most of the time, to be honest, I actually already have the direction of the sunlight figured out. I could actually skip that step. I could just like figure out how the lighting works. Next step is I put out the pose. Does the pose work the same way I tried out at home? Does the wind come in matter? Does the hair blow all around the place? If it does, I'm not going to tell you my secret. No, no, no. no. I'm not going to tell everyone my secret. I have a way of holding on the hair. Mm -hmm. And then I start putting out like micro adjustments to everything. Is the lens like, you know, close enough? Is the focal length good enough? I tried 35 at home. I don't like it. Does 50 work? Does 24 work? I have to try that because I'll speak, I'll talk more about this later because I can only get, technically speaking, I can only get one shot. Mm -hmm. I'll explain all this. Lens, After, right? let's say, mm. yep. But <laughs> what about times that it doesn't work? The place that I looked at, it's a lie. It doesn't even work that way. Like, mm. under a more, what's the word, like a more optimal situation? Like, yes, there is flowers. I know that much, but they, like, they made it in such a way that doesn't work for God. What can I do? I think of the poses immediately for that outfit, for this kind of scene. I immediately search around for places I can do. That is kind of like a compromise, and there, re there really isn't any way around it. You just have to tank with like a less optimal photo, maybe a photo you haven't planned with. Sometimes it's actually better than the one you actually planned that you would do. Yeah. I think it's it's like thirty percent of the time that a photo I didn't plan worked out better. But you know, out of topic. Anyway. So when I finish the shot for the doll itself. There's still like stands supporting it. There's like stands all over the place supporting the hair, supporting like whatever prop there is, right? Well, what I usually do is that when doing the shot itself, when I have the camera looking at a screen, become a phone controlling, whatever, I have to ensure that none of the stands is in the way of the legs, the hands. The hair, there's really no way around it. I will take the hair. I am I trying out using like you know aluminium wires? Yep. Like the ones that you bend somewhere. I'm trying I'm I'm trying to like look into using that because some of our friends told me to use that. I'm trying to look at that. But <laughs> essentially you have to avoid these things. Like let's say it's around here. Like let's use my face as an example, right? Ah, Cloning okay. this out is going to be a fucking nightmare. And trust me, <laughs> I've done that. I've ah. done that. 
and I'm sure I'm sure nobody noticed because I spent an hour doing it with it. Okay, so basically anyway. what you're saying is that uh, all these supporting structures they should not hit certain but certain parts of the of the doll, such as the face or the arms, the limbs, right? Pretty much if possible, it shouldn't even be in the way of the further. I see. But sometimes you can't have everything you want. Okay. Anyway, continue with another process. So let's say all of that's done. None of that is technically in the way aside from the hair. I remove the doll, I remove every supporting structure, and I take another shot exactly the same settings. Hopefully the lighting hasn't changed, so I don't need to do that in editing. Ah, Essentially, yeah, yeah. let's skip over all the stacking stuff. That's pretty much when we come back home and edit. I edit two photos the exact same way, and pretty much just, you know, it's a caveman way of doing it, and that's the best way of doing it, funny part. You scrub out. <laughs> I thought to die, fuck. <laughs> You scrub out the stands, you scrub out all the supporting structures and make them like disappear in a way. I used to do this with cloning when I didn't like use a tripod back in the day. And it's kind of like why I can do cloning so well, because I had to do it. There was no way around it. I had to clone everything. And even like, even today, I still need to do it sometimes because a good example is a long exposure shot. Mm. If one of the stands is in the way of a light trail. You are never going to get the same light trail twice. Yep. That's just how it happens. And oh boy, get your ass ready because you're going to clone the entire thing out. There's no <laughs> stacking option available. I've done that recently with two of my shots. I won't post them until December. I hate myself, I know. But you will see what exactly what I mean by you can't have the same, same shot twice. Even with, like, even if there's no long exposure, even if it's just lighting, especially when you're shooting near sunrise or sunset, a photo, if it's, say, one minute apart, is enough to be very different. Yep. And Great removing copy. the doll, removing the doll, removing a support structure, putting it aside and ensuring it's safe, takes more than a minute. What I usually do, at least for now, when I'm removing it, as soon as I see the doll and my hands and everything on frame, I just press shooting on my phone, like non-stop shooting, 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 because I, and I'm not sure which exactly one would work. Sometimes that might be a bird in the frame that I hate. Sometimes I mean, it might be like a dude in the frame that you just walked by and I can't do anything about, but I have to continue shooting because a good thing is that I can stack every single one of those frames. I can yeah. stack it and make it disappear. But here's the part where I, I said about like how you can't get the same shot twice and also why I bring a lot of stuff. What I typically do now is that I bring one doll. I use one of these for the doll itself and hopefully this doesn't get in the way of the clothes. I use another one for the hair if I wanted to like simulate a flying effect. And if there's a prop, say a bigger one, like a motorbike, you you should have, if anyone's looking at my like Instagram you should have seen that on my stories but, you know you need to support a bike as well because that thing's massive oh. that means three of these things just for like the doll itself don't bring more than one doll you concentrate on one yeah yeah you can bring more than one doll head and like slight detour of the topic I can never I probably can never do like two dolls at once because unless it's like a closely bounded shot together is very hard to concentrate on two subjects at once. And okay. I don't mean the photography time. I mean composing. I mean looking after both of them. I mean shooting the entire thing because if you lose one detail, trust me, that's an art vibe. You're gonna bloody see it. You're gonna bloody see it. Yeah, I mean, if you have a lot of megapixels to work with, every single flaw, every single mistake you make doing photography will be very obvious later, right? I mean, very you're obvious. just, yes, you are, you are experiencing 45 megapixel for quite recent to the past oh, few months. Gosh, yeah, oh. yeah. I, I have been using a D850 Nikon for the past five years now, so yeah, I know. How daunting it can be dealing with 45 megapixels. Your discipline with photography, your technique has to be really precise. 
You can't afford you can't to make mistakes. Anything. Yeah. No, you, you can't screw up anything. Like yeah. one slight breeze, and if it moves like less than one millimeter, mm-hmm. you can tell. You can yep. you can yes. definitely tell. You know, They're not issue? saying that you can't tell uh. with R6. Uh. You can definitely tell with that though. That though. Yeah, but see, my issue with figure photography is that, you know, no matter how you clean your figurines, there will still be a few specks of dust left. And on 45 megapixels, it is just terrible. And I really have no idea whether I should clone out, you know, spot removal with every single one of them, which will take a lot of time or just leave of them some be. I really have no idea. <laughs> and speaking of not... I do. <laughs> and speaking of never getting the same shot again not even twice right from what i understand i mean i live in malaysia this is hot climate hot climate throughout the year so i don't really experience it so the sun sets and sun rises over in australia or anywhere else with four seasons these sunsets they pass by very quickly i assume well it's not that quickly it's more like Sunrise is technically worse because you get like you get pretty much five minutes of optimal shooting time. Wow, that is very short. At least for me, frame. At, at least for yeah. me, because okay. what I mean by optimal is that like, let's say if you're not doing like a subject, not let's say not doing a doll, if you're doing like normal landscape photography, that window is more like fifteen. Okay. But for me, it's more like five because everything has to be very precise in a way. Yep. And. The really, really annoying thing with like Australia is, I know for a fact back in Hong Kong, sunrise and sunset, pretty much is like between like the coldest day of, or like the midday of winter and midday of summer. I think around like an hour apart. Okay. Like maybe an, an hour and a half, mostly, at most. Okay. I'll just tell you what happens in Australia. If it's in, if it's in December. Midsummer, sunrise is five thirty. Okay. But if it's in winter, midwinter, combined with daylight saving, do you know what it is? Nine. I mean, you you know no 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 no. I, I'll have to explain to everyone who's listening to this. Okay, daylight saving okay. is only a thing existing in some areas of Australia and also exists in some areas around the like, northern hemisphere. I know Britain. I know some like some areas in Canada because it's a thing where some things just shift one hour ahead of like everyone else. Yes, so, yes. Let's say Hong Kong and Sydney or Japan and Sydney are usually one hour apart. Now they're being two hours apart because in summer, for some dumb fuck reason, they want us like you know, one hour late. I don't fucking know. Whatever. Whatever. Anyway. <laughs> so sunrise is not that bad. Doesn't deviate all that much. Five thirty to seven. One hour, uh, an hour and a half, right? Okay. Same as Hong Kong. Why am I complaining? Because of sunset. Sunset at like peak winter is like five. Okay. Maybe earlier than that. I don't know. Last year, when I went out for sunset, I don't know what clicked in my mind or what 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 wrong with my mind. I did sunset in the middle of summer. Sunset was at eight thirty p.m. <laughs> That's not a joke. Eight thirty okay. PM. Like I don't want to go too much of a detour, but imagine in a city where shops, like majority of restaurants, close at like nine, mm-hmm. and you're taking a photo at eight thirty, and it will take you more than an hour to get to where you want to eat. Yes. Like you, you only have a few options. But anyway, tangent over. What I'm saying is, sunset is technically better because. Sunset in Sydney is actually quite a bit slower than sunrise. Mm. Optimal shooting time is around, even for me, even 15 minutes, not five. Mm. Sunrise is a lot harder and a lot trickier. I love I sunrise. See, I see. I see. Uh, Personally, I prefer sunsets over here, but over here, because of our climate, our sunsets and sunrise each, they, they're pretty much aren't much changes for the for for about fifteen to thirty minutes, you can get very similar shots. Yeah, we have that much oh. time. Yeah, fifteen to thirty minutes, and the lighting wouldn't change too much. Maybe except for the exposure value in the camera, it's just one third or two thirds of an EV value. But then, the lighting is mostly similar. 
And if we were to look at from golden hour all the way to the end of blue hour, we have 90 minutes or so. Oh man. Yes, yes. Oh, so I'm you so can shoot. Jealous. So you can stay there for two hours, you shoot right before the golden hour, all the way to the end of the blue hour, and then you have several looks, several lighting styles to choose from later. Fuck, I'm so jealous, man. Yeah. Like, it, for, us, for us, it's just... I think... Like, that even Let's give it, like, 15 minutes. What's annoying specifically about my shooting style and my, like, my how I do photography is that I have to first shoot, the, like, the photo with the doll mm. and then i have to remove the doll and then shoot the photo without the doll yeah you want to let's copy say, the background later right yep to remove let's the say, sense yeah yep I, I i minimize the time in between yeah but yeah. here's the fucked part and i have experienced this quite a lot of times there's a reason why i don't remove my camera I removed the doll, I never removed the camera until the very last second. I never even touched the tripod to the very last second because sometimes when everything is done, even when I'm packing the doll, okay. and I see this guy, I'm like, oh wow, it looks 10 times better than what it was just before. Oh <laughs> fuck. It's doable. So I just shoot the exact same scene, of course, with adjusting exposure and all that because, you know, yeah. Sun's risen up or sun's like going down, and I don't just scrub out the like the stand. I just I don't just scrub out this thing. Imagine on a green screen, I have to scrub out everything except for the doll, and <laughs> key it back into the scene. Art like artificial shadows, artificial like hazing on the ground, like artificial like touching the ground with like shoes or whatever's touching the ground mm -hmm. i had to do all of that in post just because why, the scene's a bit nicer yeah, which is why you shouldn't really back up too soon usually at uh when we do photography out we will want to be there with the setup being placed there for even 60 90 minutes straight you don't want to back up too soon because the lighting exactly. situation the lighting might change for the better you will never know the thing with weather is that the if every evening is different, every sunset is different, and you will never know your, what you're going to get until the end of the blue hour. Exactly. At least wait till. Like a, a, a very good hint is that at least when when you think you're done, when you think you're done, no, <laughs> wait ten more minutes. When ah. you think you're done, wait ten more minutes. That's yes, how I yes. learned it. Like yes, yes, and, and then after the ten minutes, thing. done. Then you were actually done. <laughs> That's pretty much how that works. And l let me tell you, I I hate editing the entire thing because if it's <laughs> if it's one of like the one of the more annoying ones where I have to key out the entire thing, mm. one of those photos can take upwards like an hour to edit. Just yeah, that part. Yeah. It, it is annoying, but you know, sometimes it's worth it. Sometimes it's not. I have had like a lot of instances where I just bin the photo. <laughs> Same experience on it's my not. side because I do focus stacking for skill figures and then you know I go through three stages from Lightroom to Helicon Focus, focus stacking and lastly in Photoshop in case I want to add, add some digital effects. Yeah, all three stages in total can take even 90 minutes or two hours one single photograph so I'm not surprised about the editing time. Yeah, and one last thing before we end today's session, we are now actually 50 minutes in. Your dolls itself, they cost a lot, right? Quite a lot, actually. Quite a lot, but... Yeah. I should say... What's the average cost of... Yours are customized from what I understand, so what are the total costs for one doll on average? On average? Okay, let's just take mine, okay? Because mm -hmm. uh, we will go over... Mm. The dolls, like the dolls itself, in a yeah. future episode, and uh, stay tuned for that one, because I am going <laughs> on like a big rant for that one. I'm okay. going on a big fucking rant, okay? Yeah, but, all the custom but... stuff and yeah, those that, that, very like expensive insane. hits, right? Yeah, that would be a future it's topic. So fucking insane. So, yeah. uh, on average speaking, my dolls are around, let's say, six hundred US dollars on average for one of these. Six hundred, like fully custom. Uh, 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 including like a random alpha slapped on, basically. 
Okay, like a that's, complete one. that's actually not too bad in the sense that I look at the price of Dolphy, Miku, the standard Miku. Yeah, uh, each is about five to 600, including the full outfit and the wig, everything. Look, here's the thing. It's because uh, most of the, maybe even half of that money is going through as licensing because you're mm-hmm. making a ca- you're buying a character. Um, yes, yes. Not just about licensing because it's ironic that if you build a doll on itself, if you if you're not looking for like a specific character, if you're not looking for specific things, well, of course you can be looking for specific styles, but if it's not like I want this thing and it can only be this thing, if it's not that, it's actually going to be way cheaper. It's actually going to be way, way cheaper. You think? Oh, okay. So the but reason it's... why these custom dolls, they are so expensive, like from some other photographers, I'm seeing them going, to thousand, uh, several thousand dollars in some cases is because they are, their customization is very specific in what kind of style they want, including the outfit and the wigs. Everything is very specific, right? Pretty much. Okay. Um, I'll just I'll just give you like everyone who's listening. You're lucky. Mm-hmm. If you listen to like the very end of that, like you deserve to know this. I'm also making one of these on my own, and it's lucky that nowadays I have connections and I can get things like slightly but not slightly quite a bit cheaper i am currently in the process of making like one of those character dolls and it can only be like one thing and that thing only but it's also a good thing that i have a lot of casual outfits i have a lot of different outfits i already use that i can use on the same doll but i I don't i don't really care it's just that i'm also doing that and having connections having like if you know what you're doing it's also going to be way cheaper Mm-hmm. That's just how it goes. Okay. So I guess that's about it for today's podcast session. Uh, there I think yeah. I write a, a bunch of tips over there on photographing, well, not just dolls outside. What they have said earlier, they also apply to scale figures in the sense that I also need to find ways to support a scale figure without the base, unless I want to go through all the cloning work to remove the base in editing later. I mean, one last thing, one last yeah. thing. Okay. It's pretty much only a me thing. Okay. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it might be some other people, but I've never met someone that's as anal as me. Because I am the kind of person that will get triggered by one single hair on like a thing I see. Okay. One speck of dust, one single hair is enough to trigger me. Mm-hmm. And um, I will just assure you if anyone has ever done a single photo in the wind outdoors imagine what a doll which is like three times lighter than your hair will be having <laughs> yeah. imagine if a slight breeze go through i'll just leave you with that thought in your mind <laughs> and let you have like a think about it that's that is one challenge that i don't have to experience as a scale figure photographer but yeah dolls the hair is a big issue which is why you love your dolls having short hairs and without all those complex hairstyles, am I right? Exactly. And uh, the one I'm making, I am kind of going against that rule and uh, mm. I am ready to have some bullshit with it. Trust me. Yeah, because I've been telling you to go for more variety. <laughs> it's kind of a thing you have to do eventually. I guess so. Like, yeah. there's no way around it. <laughs> Right, I guess that is the end of today's podcast session with Akatsuki Lemon. A lot of knowledge and new things to be learned from doll photography if you are into this hobby. So thank you very much for watching this podcast today and perhaps episode 2 will come in a month's time. Mm-hmm. Any questions, please do drop it down in the comments below and hopefully I can help you guys answer on his behalf. If you have yeah. any questions like specific dolls, specific like editing for dolls, shoot me a message on Instagram. Yeah. I'll try my best to read it. You know, Instagram yeah. these DMs. But anyway, stay tuned for the next episode. What's the next episode about again? The next episode is about the challenge of having to transfer your entire hobby from Hong Kong to Australia. What are the challenges? For example, the logistics, transportation, timing of the yeah, day that. and so on yeah yeah this is an experience that not everyone will go through unless you want to carry over your entire few thousand dollar hobbies overseas when you further your study yeah 
If you want, if you want to listen yeah. to me rant about that, stay tuned for next episode. Love yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much, and see you guys again soon. Goodbye.